Thank you. Uh, thank you for staying for the last session. So uh, myself and Albert uh, will talk about the project we did at University of Bath with Elsevier about uh, equipment and about um, indexing uh, full text documents to pick out equipment and what uh, equipment has been used. Uh, in the presentation, and it's a presentation also done with other colleagues at University of Bath, uh, that were mentioned, um, Anneke, Remy and Anushka. So in the presentation we will talk a bit about the university, about the project and what Elsevier um, did in terms of the data mining and the lessons learned from the project. So the University of Bath is a, a fairly small, small university, research intensive. We have had uh, Pure for more than 10 years now and the portal for more than five. And uh, we specialize in, we have engineering sciences, some humanities, some social sciences management. We do not have a medical school. And our research infrastructure is, it includes capital instrumentation, digital infrastructure, and very importantly, our expert technical staff, laboratory staff. And uh, organically, it has developed in departments. So uh, usually uh, funded by a funder for a specific research program associated with principal investigator. And then about seven years ago, we started to group the um, equipment into research facilities to make them more accessible, uh, better supported uh, and better financed. And now we are reorganizing it again a bit to move bigger research facilities into core research facility structure. Uh, to make it more widely accessible, more strategic in terms of invest investment and more accessible internally and externally. And uh, at the moment we have six research facilities, about 300 pieces of equipment and about 200 staff associated with them. We hold information about our shareable equipment in Pure and on the Pure, uh, Pure portal. And that's where we uh, direct our academics when they apply for new grants to check if we already have equipment. Um, in terms of assessment um, of uh, investment, it's been mainly anecdotal. We don't have any metrics beyond the usage data. So we were quite interested to see if this project would give us more data that we could use to make uh, strategic decisions about our infrastructure. So in terms of the uh, objectives, so there were two main objectives when we um, engaged with Elsevier in this project which was about seeing if we could get some evidence and some data about which um, equipment is being used in research through publications um, and, and just inform us about strategic investment and where we should be putting our money. Uh, and secondly, uh, to see how um, research st um, technical staff, laboratory staff have been acknowledged in publications and, and that's to inform uh, decisions we need to make about research culture, to improve the acknowledgement, recognition of research, uh, technical staff and, and, and to kind of have evidence to have those conversations with people. And in terms of operational goals, we had um, an aim of automating that project which previously we paid students to go through our publications, identify which could be based on specific pieces of equipment, put that into Pure. So the aim was to automate the process, uh, automatically pick up those links, add them to Pure through API and also improve our data quality around equipment and get the baseline data um, that we could start to monitor from. And now Alberto will talk about what exactly clever stuff you did. Thank you. Thank you, Dasi. So, uh, this service, we call it Equipment Monitoring Service. It's something we've been working for a while, and uh, some of you who attended the presentation by Thibault may have seen the first incarnation of this initiative, which was known as Telescope. So, what we are after is mentions of equipment in scientific publications, because that's the proof of the contribution of research infrastructure in the broader definition that Dasi gave, which includes also the technical staff and everything, to the scientific research. In order to do that, we need equipment data and we need publication data. The equipment data, we get it from Pure, because they made the effort of collecting the information and storing it into Pure. But we don't process it in Pure, directly from Pure. What we need to do is we need to link the equipment data in Pure with the equipment data in a taxonomy that we call Orion that we are building. The taxonomy includes detailed information about the equipment type, the vendor, 
the model number, and all the different name variants that are used so that we can use this information to actually find those mentions in the publications. And then we need the publications, of course, and the publications are coming from Scopus. So we create a corpus of Scopus records by looking at the affiliation in the articles from the University of Bath and also in the funding acknowledgements. We create this corpus and then what we do is we go all the way uh, back into the uh, Scopus supply chain to collect the full text of the uh, articles that were used to create these Scopus records. And that's what we feed into our text mining pipeline. Our text mining pipeline is based on uh, language models and the same technology that's behind uh, ChatGPT. <clears throat> the, 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 what our pipeline does is first it splits the article into sentences and then we have this language model that has been trained to identify sentences that mention equipment. So those sentences, the, what we call positive sentences, are then uh, annotated. We identify entity, entities within those sentences, such as equipment type, like, for example, uh, NMR, uh, spectrometer, or uh, a vendor, like a Brooker Corporation, for example, or a model number, advanced D8. So we label, we annotate the sentences with those, with those entities, and then we use combinations of those entities to identify an entry in the equipment taxonomy, an entry of, uh, of a certain uh, instrument that is linked to the, that equipment uh, uh, in, uh, in Pure. And that's what you get out of this, is essentially a link between a Scopus record and uh, an equipment uh, entry. And then, of course, this Scopus record is linked to the research output in Pure. And so we, we now have a couple equipment ID in Pure, publication ID in Pure, that we can push as a link uh, into Pure, which is what we have done. So, sharing some, some results with you. We got 331 records from uh, the, the pure uh, equipment list, of 95% of which we were able to associate with a corresponding equipment entry in our taxonomy. And in some cases, because this is relatively new, we created new entries in the taxonomy to, make, to map a certain uh, piece of equipment that we hadn't encountered before. We collected 26,000 publications from 2011 to date. 19,000 uh, of which had, for which uh, we had the full text, so it's about 70% of them that we could actually uh, process. What we got, we got out of that was 2,400 equipment uh, uh, publication links involving uh, 1,400 publications and 316 equipment items. Virtually every item that we were able to map got at least one publications associated with it. And what you see, in the, it's, it's small, but actually I encourage you to Google University of Bath Research Portal. It's live, it's available in production. And if you check the equipment section of the portal, you will see the equipment pages. And they're so much uh, richer when you have your equipment page with all the publications in it, and you can see the citations. The publications contribute to the fingerprint of the equipment, so it's a much better showcase for, for uh, your equipment. And of course, you can do all sorts of research intelligence on that information. What we learned in the process is, as always, data quality is of crucial importance. So the curation of the equipment data, although they, do, they did a pretty good job at collecting uh, the data in pure, it still requires some, some uh, curation. And because we are at early stages, and as I said, we're increasing this taxonomy as we go, we still need a human uh, in the loop for the partial matches to, to make sure that we collect all the, the relevant matches. So that led to launching a new uh, service that uh, is part of the, what we call the equipment monitoring service, which is the equipment refinement service. What we do here is to manually link the equipment data from Pure to the taxonomy, which is a crucial step that we need to do right, and, in, and also to review the partial matches to make sure that, for example, we enrich the taxonomy with new synonyms for a certain equipment model so that we can capture those links as well and increase the recall, so the number of links. And as the name suggests, these, uh, these tasks are actually performed by the Profile Refinement Service uh, team, that is the team that is doing the same thing more or less with auto profiles. So they've been trained to work on the, on the equipment data and that's what they do. And of course, we also learned that a lot of the equipment mentions are appearing in the supplementary materials, so we have included supplementary materials in our pipeline. We're doing it already 
for the Elsevier content, but we've also piloted uh, processing um, supplementary materials from other big publishers like Wiley, Taylor and Francis uh, and Plus One and others. So it's something that we are going to, uh, to add further down the road and I'll leave the conclusions to Dasit. Yeah. And then from our side, we also had lessons learned. Um, one thing that wasn't really um, surprising was the inconsistency we had in the equipment data and also the data that we have about technical staff. So in terms of equipment data, we did collect extra data to provide to Alberto, but also we got pointers on what else we would need to um, collect uh, when we want to repeat this exercise and, 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 and what as a attention we need to pay to do things because uh, we did have issues with the duplicates and not knowing which one it was and, 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 and there are things we can do to improve our data to facilitate these uh, tasks. Um, in terms of technical uh, staff, um, again, it was, it was a piece of work to go through it and identify actually who is a laboratory staff, who is technical staff, and we don't have it uh, under a specific classification in HR data. So there is a piece of work we can do to improve this information as well. Uh, we found that we were going back and forth uh, with the results and verifying search results, uh, and we did require instrument specialist input into that um, to, to say if these results look right or not. And that also required us to know who the instrument specialists are, which we didn't know always. Uh, and, and, and we g did um, uh, spot checks rather than checking all the results. Uh, we had a conversation of what is acceptable error rate for us. We came to the conclusion that we are happy with 90% being correct. So there are some things that that we wouldn't say were exact match, but we were happy with the results we got. Um, and we also had previously done exercise with manually uh, identifying the outputs. So we, we were looking at how this compared uh, with the algorithm results. Um, and then expectedly, there was a low visibility acknowledgement rate of technical staff in uh, outputs. And uh, very often uh, they were only mentioned in supplementary information, which kind of also suggests where, where academics see the value of uh, technical staff in terms of their contributions. So it is really important to look at supplementary information. Um, but also it's, a, it's kind of says something to us about the work we need to do to raise the uh, recognition rate of technical staff and their contribution. Um, and, and the other thing we learned is that when we are talking about this project across university, a lot of people were interested in understanding this relationship between outputs, equipment, people, and triangulating the data. And there is more work we need to do in this area. But that was something that many people were like, oh yeah, that sounds really interesting uh, from research culture perspective, from um, strategic approach to investment and so on. So there is real value in um, this sort of project. Uh, and then to finish in terms of takeaways, so, so it is a project itself. Uh, we started it in January, mm -hmm. so, so it took a few months. Um, and most of it was done by Alberto and Elsevier team. We provided the data, uh, but th we did uh, require a resource and we, were, uh, we had some research culture funding and we also had some um, uh, support officer time to collect the data and for us to be able to send it on. Um, it is a viable solution. It uh, has a potential for improvement. And also um, Alberto and the team did make some improvements in terms of um, how it was indexed. So. Um, uh, but yeah, there is stuff we could more do in terms of especially triangulating this data between equipment output people. We have many ideas of what we want to do with this information and where we want to go. Uh, also looking at CIWAL and uh, how facilities, what information we can get from CIWAL uh, in terms of dashboards and how we would want to see this data displayed. There are also further analysis that um, Alberto has already done that we would be interested to see. So, um, so, so there is a lot of potential for this data as well. But we feel that we have a useful baseline data for, um, for how equipment has been cited in publications so far. And, and we have data that we can build on to and we can work and we can see if the interventions we will put in place will produce results. Hopefully they will. Um, and we are looking to repeat the exercise again in, we haven't discussed, it's a surprise for him, but it's coming. Good. <laughs> uh, but probably 
two, three years time to see uh, if we have made progress, hopefully. Um, and, and finally, there is a piece of work uh, for Pure as well and for Elsevier in terms of uh, how we can actually, even when we know this person has been acknowledged in the output, how we can record this in Pure. Um, if we introduce credit taxonomy, how, how can we acknowledge that in Pure? And, and it's just even with the data we currently have, we don't really have a place to put it in Pure. So there is a piece of improvement to be uh, done in system sense. And that is all that we had. Do you have any questions? So thank you very much, uh, Datsi and, and Alberto. So we want to open it for maybe one question. Uh, hi, Chris uh, from Lancaster. Uh, how um, well does the AI cope if the equipment's actually based at another institution? So if our, you, our colleagues are collaborating with another institution and the equipment's actually based somewhere else, how does the AI uh, deal with that? Uh, that's probably the most difficult thing to do. Uh, there's ways in which we limit the chance of that happening, it, which is by essentially limiting ourselves to the uh, corpus of publications coming from an institution, which is, of course, doesn't resolve the problem completely. We are also annotating the name entity recognition. One of the steps is also annotating the facility. So if we find the, um, the facility being explicitly mentioned either in the full text uh, next to the mention of the equipment or in the funding acknowledgements, which is also what uh, opens, uh, often happens, then that's a, a, a signal that we, that we consider in our, in our linking. A common pattern is that you will see the specific instrument mentioned in the materials and methods section, and then in the funding acknowledgements, in the acknowledgement section, they will say, and thanks to the uh, University of Bath or lab, uh, whatever, for supporting the, the, the research. So those are the kinds of, of signals that we capture. There's more sophisticated ways of, of dealing with the issue that we look like looking at the co-authorships. So if all the authors are from the same institution, of course, that's a slam dunk, easy. Um, uh, there are ways to look at the, uh, at the authorship networks to kind of identify uh, looking at not just one paper at a time, but looking throughout the corpus uh, and to infer the attribution of the equipment to the, to the publication uh, in, you know, in a uh, correct way, hopefully. But that's an area of active investigation at the moment. Thanks, uh, Søren from uh, Aalborg University in Denmark. Uh, interesting uh, project. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, maybe not a question, but, but more of a suggestion. Uh, have you considered looking at uh, data sets as a way to identify the usage of uh, equipment, uh, like in a service such as a data monitor? Uh, I mean, a good data set, metadata, should probably include uh, uh, what equipment was used to, to generate uh, the data set. Um, but yeah, it's just a suggestion that pub or an idea. Yeah, it's a very valid suggestion. We've actually designed our uh, model to be able to work with any piece of uh, of text. So it's not designed to. We trained it on scientific data, but if you have a readme in a, in a data set that contains a, a description of the instruments that were used, the technology will be able to pull out those, those mentions as well. We actually also worked with the UKRI and specifically with the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK. They have large instruments and they produce a lot of data. And in that case, we were able to link the, the data sets to the equipment. So we, we found the mentions of the equipment in the publications. We found the acknowledgements, the grant ID, and through that grant ID, we were able to, to identify the data sets that were produced by the instrument because there's a, they code that information in the DOI. So it, that's another interesting area of development. And the other thing that we tested with them is the software. Because especially in those cases, you have large instruments that produce the raw data, but then in the data processing pipeline, there's always one or two software tools that are used to, to process the data and come up with the results. So that's another interesting area that we've heard and that we would like to investigate. I think the cool thing about this project is that we're opening up a new, uh, a whole new dimension of potential by looking at the full text. Because when, when you work with, uh, with traditional ANI databases such as Scopus PubMed 
and Web of Science, you're only looking at the head and the tail of the articles, and the good stuff that's in between is get, gets lost. But we have the opportunity to look into that and capture signals and create relations with other entities. So I'm looking forward to applying this technique, not just to, to equipment, but also to, to other uh, research outputs that are of interest for institutions.